Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. Today, we're going to talk about markets, equity markets, bond markets, and commodity markets. And today, they all share one thing in common. They are utterly broken. At least they are if you think markets should be fair and level playing fields where prices are determined by the collective actions of thousands, if not millions of market participants who are carefully weighing and sorting through the same information as they make their decisions. However, if your intent is not to have a level playing field and your intent is to rig the markets either for gain or policy purposes, then these markets aren't broken. They've never been better. Discussing these markets with us today is a man we first interviewed on this subject back in 2011, long before the book Flash Boys by Michael Lewis came out and shined some additional light on this much needed subject. Joe Saluzzi is partner, co-founder, and co-head of Equity Trading of Trading LLC, a leading independent agency brokerage firm that trades equities for institutional money managers and hedge funds. Now, Joe is one of the foremost experts on algorithmic trading, often referred to as high frequency trading or HFT, and the dangerous risks it has introduced into our financial markets. Along with Sal Arnock, he is author of Broken Markets, How High Frequency Trading and Predatory Practices on Wall Street Are Destroying Investor Confidence in Your Portfolio. Hey, welcome back, Joe. It's great to have you back on again. Chris, thanks for having me. It's been a while. Appreciate it. So, Joe, after all the attention of the excesses of HFT, uh, after all these years, what, if anything, has been done by the regulators to right the wrongs and give us back our markets? They haven't done too much. They've done some what we call Band-Aid fixes. Uh, After the flash crash of 2010, they put through the uh, limit up, limit down circuit breakers, which will basically prevent a stock from moving more than 5 or 10% in a matter of minutes, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I think that's that's prudent, and they should have done that a while ago, and they got rid of something called a a single stock, um, a stub quote. But those are kind of cosmetic changes. They haven't really addressed... You know the bigger issues, which we consider, you know, fragmentation, the mul- all the excess exchanges, all the market structure issues that have led to this type of trading that has changed. You know, the markets have certainly changed over the last 15, 20 years. You don't have those fundamental investors that are setting price like you mentioned earlier. You have more. It's an algorithmic race. You've got spoofing. You've got all sorts of stuff going on now, setting price. So. I think they still need to address the market structure areas that we've talked about many times. And lately, actually, the SEC just came up with something called the Market Structure Advisory Committee after, you know, five years after the flash crash that will be meeting for the first time next month to discuss certain market structure issues. But we'll see if anything comes out of that. Do you know who's going to be sitting on that? Yeah, actually, we do. And it's it's actually a large group, uh, much larger than we thought it would be. There's 17 members in the group. We were actually, we were proposed to be in it. Unfortunately, we didn't make the final cut. We think there were some vetoes to, <laughs> to our nomination. It doesn't surprise us at all. But, you know, many of the members are what we consider status quo industry types who want to leave things just the way they are and are basically making money and what we call the arms merchants, some of the exchanges and so on, who have, have a vested interest in leaving things just the way they are. But then there are also some others who, who are out there and they're going to ask some good questions. Unfortunately, we think they're in the minority of the 17. Well, yeah, let, let's uh, uh, keep an eye on that. But I, I have to tell you, after all these years of, of seeing the glacial pace at which the SEC has decided to move and the CFTC on these things, it's, it's uh, clear to me that, that technology is still winning this race. And many of the things that, that they talk about, which should be, to me, obviously and patently illegal, like, like just uh, spoofing or throwing quotes in there that you have no intention of filling, uh, those still happen to my eye all the time. I follow the guys at Nanex. I look at their at their market liquidity structures. It's obvious there's shenanigans going on all the time. Yeah, and, and I think what's happened is the markets have evolved, and, and the markets have certainly, obviously, embraced computerization and technology, and and all of which things have been some things have been very good for the markets. We've brought down costs, but regulators don't seem to have evolved. They don't seem to have caught up with times. They don't necessarily have the eyes and ears out there to monitor things on a microsecond or nanosecond level. Just as an example, they have proposed putting together, the SEC has proposed a consolidated audit trail. 
This came about after the flash crash as well, back in 2010. And we're five years into this, and they're still out for bid, waiting for someone to bid on the project. And it's nowhere near completion. And even when it does get completed, it's still not going to be an all-encompassing view. They're not going to, they won't be able to see futures because the CFTC monitors that group. So it'll be an incomplete set. It'll be better than what they have now, which is called MIDAS, which is basically a bunch of direct uh, data feeds that are supplied by the exchanges. And MIDAS, by the way, was built by a high-frequency trader named Named, uh, TradeWorks and that still gets paid on by, uh, by the SEC over a couple million dollars a year for this thing. So it makes you wonder: did it, are they properly equipped to monitor it? And when you see cases like spoofing pop up, and you're like, how could they have missed it? As you mentioned, Eric Hunt said it from Nanex. He sees this stuff all the time, and he tweets it. And I mean, if I was a regulator, I would just follow Eric, and I'd say, there, there's an example right there. I don't have to do the work; I'll just follow Eric because he's doing the work. Yeah, just just have just put Eric on your payroll for a couple of days. Throw him a few bones and see what he comes up with. It's it'd He'll be do amazing. it very cheaply because he he wants efficient, fair markets as well. Absolutely. So uh, let let's talk about markets for a bit. You mentioned the flash crash that that event on May six, two thousand ten, where where markets really plummeted. Uh, originally blamed on a fat finger trade by a trader out of the Midwest, out of uh, Reed and Waddell. Today, big news. I'm sure you've been swamped with calls around this. Uh, the SEC has decided, no, no, it was some guy operating out of a small bungalow in London. Uh, have you, tell us what your thoughts are on this. I mean, it's truly amazing. I, I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but, but the, the, the case actually brings up so many more questions than answers. But, but, but let's go back to what you just said. And originally, they all blamed a, a mutual fund trader out of Kansas City for basically entering a, an order for his own clients. So they're blaming someone who actually turns out to be the victim. And they were the victim because there was a spoofer, this fellow by the name of Sorio, uh, trading out of the U.K., who they now have no, they, they have all the documents. He was 20 to 29 percent of the orders in the E-mini futures contract for the three hours prior to the flash crash. This guy was enormous for one guy coming out of, a, out of an apartment with a, with a software package that was modified by one of his vendors. So it, it makes you scratch your head and say, wait a second, how could they not have seen this? And why did it take him so many years? And, and let's be real, do, do we honestly think that there's only one person in the world running the same strategy that this guy was doing? I, I can't imagine it was one guy, but I, I do think that he certainly exacerbated the move on that day because if he was that significant amount of, of, of orders, he certainly had something going on. But it, it wasn't the cause of the flash crash. You know, the flash crash was caused by a poor market structure that went out of control. And actually, and when the CFTC and the SEC did put out a report five months after the crash, they noted that it was they called it hot potato trading, where basically market makers were flipping back and forth. And once their inventory positions got exhausted or their risk levels got too high, they were shutting down. And many of them were quoted afterwards saying that we just stopped trading and exited the market. That's why you had a flash crash, because there was a void in liquidity which makes you think, well, where are the obligations? What is a market maker today? Do they have any obligations to supply real liquidity? Or can they enter an exit like this guy in the U.K. and pretend to be adding liquidity when, in fact, he was just spoofing? So the case is troubling. It's troubling for so many reasons. I mean, it's, where was his broker? Why weren't they looking at it? Where was the CME where all the trades were being done? Why didn't they come after him, although they did, but then they, they seemed to just do nothing five years ago? And then finally, where was the CFTC? So who's watching the shop here? And that, to me, it, it's, it's very troubling. You know, this whole idea of the market structure is really important to me because, again, following uh, the work at Nanex by Eric Hunsader is, uh, shows that uh, this volume, it comes and goes at the you know blink of an eye. And, and so I had Bart Chilton on this show recently, uh, formerly of the CFTC, a commissioner there, now out in private private world. And he said that he thought recent reports had proven to him that HFT programs and, and the like were good for investors because they brought down prices, which I agree with, and provide liquidity to the markets. I disagree with that one. Where do you stand on, on HFT and liquidity? Well, that's the old liquidity, you know, liquidity and volume. What are they? There are different types of things. But, but let, let's differentiate amongst HFT. HFT is such a hard thing to define. I was actually on a CFTC subcommittee where we were trying to, my task was to define HFT. And in the end, we didn't. they came up with a definition that I, I actually dissented to. I didn't think it was a good definition because it didn't have an inventory component in it, which at the end of the day, most of these HFTs are flat or relatively flat when it's maybe it's one instrument versus another. But the bottom line is, there are different types, right? There's electronic market making, which 
for the essential, for most part, it is a good thing in the sense that there's no other market maker nowadays. The traditional is left, so someone's got to make a market. And these electronic market makers do quote two-sided spreads, although the quantities are much, much smaller than you would expect a real market maker to commit. But let's just assume for a minute that that's benign and that that's good for the market. And that's what Bart's talking about. Well, if Bart's defending that, I don't think I would take an issue with that. But now let's talk more about the predatory and, um, and, and some of the momentum ignition and, and things like spoofing like we were just talking about and more of the proprietary trading HFT that's out there just looking to pick off an order or front run demand and supply. And I use the term very carefully when I say front run. Not front running an order because that's illegal. If I had an order from a client and I, I traded ahead of it for myself, that's illegal and I go to jail. What they do is they, they basically they, 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 they take a look at the order book and they say, okay, where's the buyers, where's the sellers? Once I think that there's more buyers than sellers, I'm going to try to front run that based on the technological advantage that I have due to my co-location ability or my microwave networks or whatever it is. So they front run demand and they front run supply. It's not fundamental-based trading at all. They don't care what they're trading. They're just getting ahead and they're trying to sell it to you or, or flip it back you know, before you even know it. So that's not helping anybody. That's not adding to the price discovery process. That's the scalping in an automated fashion, which is very hard to detect or very hard to monitor for the regulator. So BART, in the, in the past, BART Chilton has said that there's white hats and black hats of HFT. Okay, and I'll, I'll agree with that. But what I don't hear from BART is tell me more about these black hats. Who are they? What are they doing? What have you seen them do? Can we go after them? Let's find out some details because if there really are, you need to start spilling the beans. And, and as, a, as a guy who represents the industry, I would think he would know. Well, absolutely. That, that was, I found that a little, a little shocking at the time um, because certainly I, I've seen and read enough to uh, understand that there are black hats out there. And, and so um, here's an area, perhaps, that, that sort of brings this out to light a little bit for me. So and let's talk about this idea of providing liquidity. I, I think we need to reverse that word providing. Uh, I think this should be called sucking liquidity. There, there's a firm out there that recently was uh, describing the results of, of their trading and uh, in this HFT universe. And over an entire six-year span, they reported that they had somehow lost money on one day. Every other single day, they were pulling in, on average, one and a half to two million dollars a day from whatever it is that they were doing, and and, and uh, uh, publicly the CEO came out and said, explained this by saying, "Well, we win more than we lose, right?" Okay, so he, let's do some math. If there's even a half a percent chance of losing, one half of one percent chance of losing on any given day, then the odds of that happening, of that company turning in one trading lost day out of six years, is over one out of fifty-eight thousand. So, so the odds. If we decide to um, say there's a 50-50 chance of, you know, real trading involves risk, uh, you can't even, my Excel is incapable of calculating the odds on a 50-50 chance <laughs> because right, I, get, right. I get a div zero error in there. And it's, there's probably not enough atoms in the universe to, to actually make the, the denominator of the one out of X statement of probability. So so is what this company doing, is it's not really trading then, is it? Because it seems to be risk-free. Well, I, I think I think what he's saying is that you know there there are losing trades, right? But what they what they appear to have is a risk management system that is able to minimize those losses quickly. And maybe on the on the buy side or on the winning side, maybe they're letting the winners run a little bit more. I'm not sure. But and I think also one of the parts that he left out was the scratch trades, the ones that he didn't make or lose money. What percentage was that? So it appears that it's more. It, it is a law of large numbers. That's what they're trying to explain, where they're, they're trading millions and millions of times a day, and they've built this model. And, and, and the model also, by the way, is, is not just equities, and it's not just futures. It's multi-asset, and it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's you know, the multiple books of currency, bonds, futures, options, all different instruments where – you know, I would imagine that there's some big GUI up there, that you know, some some interface which tells them where their risk exposure is at all times amongst these instruments, which somehow produces money. You know, it does scare me. That's obviously in the days of technology and software and hardware, there could be failures at any point in the system. And what would happen if you know part of that Rube Goldberg machine all of a sudden collapses and the marble doesn't get to the end where it's supposed to go? I don't know. That that's what happened to Knight Capital, and they lost 440 million dollars on one day. Yeah, and and uh, and before they figured out where the uh, the electricity plug was to this thing, <laughs> just yanked it out of the wall. I guess pull the plug quick. Right. So so, but uh, the important point came up, which is that these companies who are in this space, they're not just 
they're not really focused on any one particular asset. They might be in options, futures, uh, across uh, indexes, ETFs, individual shares, trades. They, they're, they're kind of, they have tentacles into all kinds of things. And, and their system would involve being positioned in one arena or asset compared to another. Let's make it tangible. Let's say I want it to be long oil futures, but I, I thought that at some point I was going to reverse that and go short. It wouldn't hurt to have some puts on USO, uh, the oil ETF. It wouldn't hurt to have some, maybe some individual puts on uh, individual uh, energy companies, et cetera, and so forth. Like like you're saying, they might, they might have a, a more of a complete map across a set of related assets when they're running yeah. a strategy. Yeah, I, I think so, and I, and I think the goal is to be as close to neutral when it comes to risk as possible. You may be long the oil, like you said, long the oil and maybe short the ETF or whatever it may be, and you're trying to minimize that, and it may actually require them holding positions overnight as long as they are hedged into neutral. Now, you know, they're really, they're obviously not investors like, you know, Warren Buffett or, you know, some long-term investor, and they don't necessarily care about the long-term health of the company, but what I would like to see is if, if they are truly market makers, I would like to see more obligations on these market makers. Right now, there really isn't much of an obligation to quote an equity. I mean, you can be within 8% of the market and you're considered a market maker. So that's nothing. And I think, actually, there are a couple of these larger electronic market makers who have actually argued for more obligations. And they said, you know what, I don't have a problem putting in a larger obligation. So what's happening is there, there's kind of a divergence going on amongst the larger HFTs and then the smaller ones who are more of kind of what we would consider are parasitic that are just kind of playing the game and, and, and kind of hovering around. Where if you're going to come in and you're going to make a larger market and you want to be, and I, I don't have a problem if they want to get compensated, obviously by earning a spread. Well, then they deserve it if they're going to supply an obligation to the market. We need a market maker. Unfortunately, the traditional ones have gone, and so there is a void out there. When times like the flash crash happen, you hope that there's a market maker there to hold it. And you know, if, as the old saying goes, to, to calmer, you know, calmer thought, calmer heads prevail. But, you know, right now there's a bit of a void there. So we'll see. I mean, that, that is an argument that's going out there, whether or not market makers should have more obligations. Well, that, that would certainly, I, I think, go a long way as well as putting maybe some latency on the trades as well. So you have to hold something for, I don't know, let's <laughs> pick something ridiculous, 200 milliseconds. Oh, that's ridiculous. Way too long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about correlations then, because today it seems to me, this is this is my observation. I, I'm out here in the cheap seats, remember. But it seems to me that you can explain a lot of what happens in both U.S. stocks and in global commodities if you simply follow the United States dollar index against the Japanese yen. That correlation uh, explains a lot of other things. The correlations are really high. So what it appears to me is that we now have global strategies that are being traded where um, I'm not sure fundamentals really come into play, or at least I have a hard time myself fundamentally explaining why a change in the value of the yen should move the chain, should really radically alter the price of gold in London. Uh, how do we begin to understand this? Yeah, and I, I think like what we were talking about before with these multi-asset strategies, that tends to explain it a little, where when a currency starts to move, well, then I better get short equities or whatever it may be. And it does scare me in that I am wondering, are prices now, are, you know, what happened to the price discovery mechanism? Is, you know, is it really being set by fundamental investors who have looked at the company and, and look at long-term aspects? Or is it now being set, whether it's on Fed policy or some algorithm that's tied to one currency pair versus the other? And then where are we going? Are we getting into some bubbles in certain areas? Because no one's really looking at valuations. All they care about is, okay, I made money today, and I start fresh tomorrow because every night I go home flat, and I start the game all over again. That's a scary thought. That's a scary thought that these multi-assets are now playing into each other. And that, like you said, the correlation is so tight and that when one market sneezes, they all catch a cold really, really quickly. Now. It's true. And I, that, that is my, my concern. I'm having a hard time quantifying it. But the idea is that um, it feels like we're just in a large speculative environment where the relative movements of these asset classes is what's important, not the absolute underlying value. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think we have to blame central bank intervention. I mean, how could we not? I mean, it's all around the world. They're setting interest rates at a ridiculous, you know, at a ridiculous thing. You know, quantitative easing is distorting all sorts of prices of assets. The amount, the amount of supply on a lot of these bonds is going down to almost zero. So how do you price things anymore when you have such a giant manipulator out there? Well, let's talk about that manipulator real quick because here, here's some other slight sources of concern for me. I mean, we learned in 2013. Um, that I think 13 out of 60 central banks were buying equities, right? Uh, uh, Switzerland, um, Israel, 
obviously Bank of Japan. So we knew that. And we knew that the CME introduced a central bank incentive program. Um, so this is, you know, the CME is where futures and options are being traded on equities, commodities, other things, right? Uh, so how do we, how do we under, like, we know that these central banks are, are not just manipulating things or influencing whatever word you want to use by driving the price of money down and flooding the world with liquidity, but they are actively active enough in the CME that they have their own preferred buyer program. And now we know that the New York Fed is moving a staff office out there to be closer to that action too. Uh, how do we interpret, how do you interpret those, those moves? I, I mean, I, <laughs> I shake my head. I mean, incentive programs just in and themselves Really, you know, a lot of times the CMA and some of these exchanges, they put them out there to stimulate a new product. So, so say a new hog futures contract comes up or whatever it is, and they want to get some activity in it, and they'll stimulate a market, make it a quote, a two-sided market by giving them an incentive program. Somehow these incentive programs don't tend to go away. They just are always there. Once they're there, they, they continue to get paid. And that, that's how you distort asset pricing when you're starting to give all these rebates and whatnot. But for central banks, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the Fed is doing. I don't know what they're buying. Apparently, the Bank of Japan is a little bit more active, I guess, when it comes to ETFs and a little bit more transparent about what they're buying. But sure, these these are assets that they're buying not based on fundamentals or based on what they like. They're buying it because they're trying to get some... They need to do some of the money they've created, and they're trying to juice the markets. It's just... Um, look, I, I shake my head like everybody else, and or most well, guys like us who think this is ludicrous and that they're distorting market prices. There are others out there which think that these are part of market forces and that if the central bank is coming in to buy stocks, well, that's a source of demand. Therefore, the assets should be going price higher and the market is being priced appropriately. I think that's ludicrous. I think by printing money and, and stimulating asset prices is, is basically just a distortion and eventually it's going to come crashing to the real, to the real price. So I don't know. I, I don't think it's it's certainly a a key driver in what's going on out there, but I really don't know what to make of these guys or how long they will continue doing it. Well, yeah, I'm sure you saw that Wall Street Journal article about the Bank of Japan's ETF buying activities and that yeah. they, they had bought a lot and that they preferentially would step in and buy on days when the market was down, you know, to like 79% of their trades were, if the market was down, they were in there buying. So, so that feels supportive, obviously. And I don't think it's illogical for somebody to look at that and say, maybe I should buy this too. But uh, where I do depart from from the script is when the Wall Street Journal today announced that the the Nikkei had broken twenty thousand, and they listed a variety of reasons why that might have happened, uh, including improved corporate profitability, a return, you know, all this stuff. They didn't mention central bank buying. <laughs> like, I forgot that part. Huh? How did you miss that one? Well, you, you just did you the know, great article is, on it. <laughs> it is, you know, basically what it is is the biggest buyback in the world, right? You yeah. know, talk about corporate buybacks. That's obviously another way of, of distorting asset prices. But this is what central banks are doing is the largest buyback in the world. It's crazy. What you're doing it with bar money they don't even have. Why didn't we think of this before? It seems so simple. <laughs> so, I think there was a guy named Ponzi who thought of it a few years back. <laughs> well, so let, let's imagine for a moment that you're writing uh, a financial thriller, okay? And in this masterpiece of fiction, uh, Joe, let's imagine that a variety of centralized powers, they're interested in stocks going higher for, for a set of policy reasons, maybe. And they want to communicate economic vigor, so they use higher stock prices as their signaling mechanism, perhaps... You're a central bank, and, and uh, you want to create the so-called wealth effect, and you want to drive equities higher. Hypothetically, in this work of fiction, if you did want to gun markets higher, defend breakdowns, critical support levels, all that, describe how that might be done and whether these computer algorithms would make that job easier. Well, that's a, an excellent question, and, and it would be done... You can be very sloppy. I, was, I, I trade for my job for a living is to trade for institutional clients. That's how we get paid here. So my, I need to go in and out of stocks quickly and efficiently and trying to leave as little footprints as possible so that no one can kind of find out that my institutional guys are either buying or selling. If I leave big footprints, guess what happens? They come and they, they're like a parasite. They jump on top and they will drive that asset up or, or knock that stock down really quickly, and then there are certain algos that some people use, certain algorithms, that will just continue to chase the price, whether it's up or down. Obviously, what I'm doing here is I'm going to be a little more discreet. If I think someone's trying to you know, goose a stock, I'm not going to chase it. I'm going to wait. We're going to be more strategic. But let's just say I was somebody who really wanted that stock price to go higher. I could be very sloppy and how I wanted to buy the 10,000 shares of stock that I needed to buy on the day. And guess what? The parasites will jump all over me, and they will drive that price up even higher. 
So it is a very interesting point where I, I think I've even, I've got, I don't know if I've ever tweeted this out, but QE plus HFT equals real dangerous stuff. So you <laughs> could, you know, it is dangerous. There, there is that parasitic effect that doesn't care what it's buying or selling. And then if you got somebody else out there saying, well, I really don't care. I'm going to be sloppy. I'm going to go out there and just goose it up because I want that price higher. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder, you know, what would happen. I can tell you for a fact, but if you're not careful and you're trying to execute a large percentage of a stock, say 10 to 20 percent in a single day, you will drive that stock up very, very quickly. It doesn't take much. All it takes is, for instance, if say the stock is $10 and 10 cent bid offered at 10.15, if I go out there and I place a 12 cent bid for a thousand shares out loud, lit on an exchange, that stock's off to the races assuming there's no natural seller out there. Okay, let's assume no one's hanging around in a dark pool or whatever. Next thing you know, it'll be 13 cent bid offered at 16, then it'll be 15 cent bid offered at 20, 20 cent bid offered at a quarter, and maybe 500 shares is traded. And now a sloppy algo will come in and buy the quarter stock. And what happened? A thousand shares traded and the stock's up 30 cents because you were sloppy, right? So you have mm -hmm. to be careful. Careful, or or perhaps that's um, that weakness is also a strength. If and this is my hypothetical thing, it's yeah. like if you wanted to goose a market, it seems easy to me today potentially with these with all these piranhas in the water waiting for blood. Um, in fact, you would want to be sloppy, do something really dumb, like throw two hundred million dollars, uh, you know, uh, at market into us into one corner, and you'll get you'll get an outsized sort of a response to that. I would bet. Yeah, 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 and you can even take the argument uh, a little sidestep if you talk about corporate buybacks. Corporate buybacks have very strict – they have strict rules what they have to follow. They can't cross the spread. They can only be a certain percentage of volume. They can't trade in the middle of the year or beginning of the day, the end of the day. But let's just say while it's running, these, these corporate buybacks normally are put into these what they call 10B18 algos, which are pretty stupid in my opinion. They just go out there and they just mechanically go about it. Well, they're – fairly easy to spot by sophisticated traders and machines, let's just say. So let's just say you were a corporate executive and you needed to buy back some stock. Would you be upset that some guy just drove up the price of your stock and you didn't get to buy any that day, which means you got extra ammunition for the buyback to continue, and maybe it goes to an options period where you're due some options? Who knows? <laughs> so if this all feels like a, a game, you know, at, and I was reading a book once about um, uh, late dynamic Roman Empire, where they were really heavily debasing their currency, and, and, and several observers were bemoaning that, that people had basically given up productive enterprise in favor of speculation, because speculation was far more rewarding on a work per unit of return effort sort of a thing. And so, again, you had all the, what felt to me like, like similar behavior sets that I think we've got today, which it does feel less fundamentally driven and far more speculatively driven. Obviously, we see this when the Fed comes out and makes statements and the market responds as if, you know, um, God himself had spoken. Yeah, and, you know, there are, there are a lot of folks that say, look, the market dictates the price and the market's never wrong. And, you know, look, I understand that and I understand the market is the price. But, but what about the blend of market? I think what you're saying is the blend of market participants has changed so much where it used to be a, let's say, 100 people in a room and some were institutions, some were retail, some were prop trading scalpers. That's okay. Everybody, there was this nice blend of, of different buyers and sellers. And at the end of the day, you set price based on really fundamental valuations. Whereas now, that blend of 100 buyers and sellers has changed to the point where, you know, scalpers and prop trading guys are, are the predominant ones and the retail and institutional are so small, the real long-term owners don't really represent, don't have that price setting ability anymore. And that's, that's a very scary thought. So let, let's, let's, uh, let's finish our, our financial thriller novel. And, and in this novel, here's a plot twist. Um, a former head, a former chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, exits his post and shortly thereafter actually joins uh, a firm that that it's huge. It's a huge firm. I mean, it might be it might be so large that it trades approximately 13 percent of all U.S. consolidated volume in equities and maybe 20 percent of U.S. listed equity options uh, volume uh, optically. Would that look good, do you think? Or, or do you think people would find that that plot twist unbelievable? Oh, what, what a movie you're creating, by the way. I can't imagine anything like this would actually happen. It's got to be fiction, right? Uh, you know, it's just it's just baffling. Of all the firms you could have went to, of all the firms, of all the investment banks, why would you go to that one? I just don't understand it. I mean, obviously, we all know there's money involved and whatnot, but it really was, I mean, it took the air out of it. You know, I, was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, really? Come on. Is that really, really necessary? So it's too bad, and, and of course, you know, what kind of secrets does he have now? Well, obviously nothing going forward, but he certainly knows a lot about what went on in the past. 
So that's what the best of you know, the, the largest amount of money tends to get that, and, and I'm sure he was uh, uh, offered quite an attractive contract. Yeah, and, and uh, it just optically, from from where I said it, it, it just looks awful. Um, Terrible. And uh, was not a big fan of that. So, so in your mind, uh, as you look at, you know, you're in the markets every day, you, you've seen what changes have been made. Uh, are we still in danger of having uh, another flash crash type event? Absolutely. I, I think it could happen any day. And, and this, this Sorrell, Sorrell case from the UK flash trader, flash, uh, flash crash spoofer, proves that it's still going on every day, that there is manipulation in the market, and that regulators really don't have a good grip on what's going on. So am I more comfortable now than I was five years ago? No. And, 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 we, and, and like we, I'll bring up Eric again. Eric comes out and sees it every day. And it's in a more of a smaller, it's not a flash crash thing, but there are stocks that move. There are asset classes. There are you know, exchanges overseas all of a sudden that come out of nowhere and they move 5%. The DAX moved the other day real quickly. It happens all the time, but maybe not in the severity of a flash crash of you know, 10% or whatever it was then. But absolutely, I think it could happen again. I'm not comfortable. I think regulators are, are slowly moving through. And, and when it happens again, they'll all get trotted before Congress and they'll be, you know, hold up their right hands and swear to tell the truth. And they'll say, gosh, honest, I really didn't see it coming. No, you did. You really hmm. did. And, and, and you dragged your feet and you did nothing about it. And it, it's very frustrating to us. And, you know, we've had numerous conversations with regulators over the years. I've sat before the SEC. I've sat before the CFTC. And I, I think, I mean, I really like Mary Jo White a lot. I really like the SEC, what they're trying to do, but they just seem to be hitting roadblocks every time they make a turn. And the industry loves it that way. The industry doesn't want it to change because of the cash machine right now. Why would they want it to change? So it's a very tough thing for them, but they got to get on. they got to get by this and, and push through those roadblocks and really go out there and say, okay, how do we make our markets more fair and more transparent? is really what's the issue here. We need more disclosures. We need to want to know what's going on in the dark pools. Why are there all these exchanges? Do we really need them? Should we put minimum market shares? There's lots of things they can do to clean this thing up relatively quickly, but they just don't seem to be acting. So have you traded at all on, on the new exchange that got stood up as a, as a, as a allegedly a, and hopefully an HFT-proof exchange? Uh, IEX is, yeah, we are actually members of IEX. They're not a, a full exchange yet. There's still an, AT, an ATS or an alternative trading system. They've applied for exchange status, and, mm -hmm. and we are big fans, I can tell you, huge fans of IEX. And we've got some of our best fills for our institutional clients on IEX. We're, you know, size liquidity, block volume to being done, which is what I'm trying to do here, without the movement that you would get. And what I, I, I refer to it as wiggle and movement. Remember I was saying before, if I place a bid for 10 cents, you know, 12 cent bid for a thousand, it starts to move. You don't get that in IEX because it's, it basically is a dark pool right now. You're in there, but they don't have, for whatever reason, they don't have the predatory, whether it's their magic shoe box or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever they call it, they don't have the predators that hang in there. And they do have HFT, which is very interesting. Some of their biggest clients, and they've admitted this, are high-frequency trading market makers who don't seem to have a problem with the way IEX is set up. And, and like I said earlier, I don't have a problem trading with an HFT. If the HFT is the other side of my trade and wants to put up 5,000 shares, hey, let's do it. I want to buy it. You want to sell it. Let's go. But if the other guy is just trying to ping me and sniff me and then goose the price, i got a big problem. So we're not finding that type of negative behavior in IEX, which is why we like them a lot. I hope they succeed. I hope they become an exchange. I hope they keep getting bigger. And I hope more real liquidity keeps going in there because that makes the price discovery process better and it makes for efficient allocation of capital. I love that. I love that story. And it seems it seems as simple as the magic shoebox with the 13 miles of, of yeah. fiber optic coiled up in it or yeah. whatever they've got. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that's enough to get get the uh, most of the HFT out of the way. And, and that's a good thing. So so that's a positive development. But on balance, you think the market structure still looks uh, a little broken. And uh, and uh, so how confident are you that that will avoid uh, some sort of a flash crash going forward, let's say in the next five years? No, I, I mean, we'll have an event. There, there's no doubt there'll be events. Will it be as severe as the last one? I don't know, but mm -hmm. there'll be events. I mean, it's just called once volatility starts to spike, and we've been in this kind of mundane, you know, dreary market, just kind of mar marches up every day, right? And it's very quiet for most days. Volumes have been low. Once you start to get some spikes in volatility and some, some more shenanigans, you're going to have an event. There, there's no doubt in my mind. And how will, how will it be managed? I think if, you know, 
people want to feel confident in the market. That's where the regulators have to come out the next day and say, we found it, we caught the cause, we've got them, we've arrested them already. That's not going to happen, by the way. But if they did, at least I would feel a little bit more comfortable that they were on top of this. But there's no doubt there'll be more of these events. You know, like I said, for us, it's market structure. It's not necessarily market participants that, that, that bother us the most. You know, there are things they can do, whether it's limited, like I said before, the exchanges, the fragmentation in the equity market is really what's causing a lot of the problems and a lot of the noise volume that you see. You've got to start to limit. There's no need to have 12 exchanges. You know, you, there's no need to have one exchange. There's some number in between, and I don't know that number. But maybe you should put a minimum market share on an exchange for them to have a protected quote. That's one of our suggestions. And when it comes to dark pools, maybe dark pools that trade on average less than 300 shares really shouldn't have a license to have an ETS or an alternative trading system because they're really not adding any value at that point. If you did that, you'd knock out about 25 dark pools overnight. You start to get rid of the fragmentation, which means that you then start to bucket liquidity where you get a much better price discovery process then. You know, small things. You don't have to do a lot. Rebates, you know, it might take a model on our opinion is, is is noise to the market. You don't need to pay for the liquidity. It should be a flat fee like IEX, by the way, charges a flat fee whether you make or take. We think that's the, the, re, the model that all exchanges should adopt. So, again, not too much there in the way of, of, of fixing things, but small fixes can go a long way. They have done some work on order types. The, the SEC has mandated a little bit more disclosure there, which is good. On the, on the lit exchanges, but they haven't done anything on the dark pools. You really, you know, the Barclays case, I mean, I wouldn't talk about that, but the Barclays case brought up a whole bunch of noise when it came to dark pools as to what was going on inside the dark. You need more disclosure. When 35 to 40 percent of, of orders are being executed off exchange, we really need more disclosure as to what's going on there. And so uh, remind me of the Barclays case. What was that? Barclays, which is ongoing, was the uh, New York State Attorney General found that Barclays was misrepresenting their dark pools to their institutional clients. They were saying things that allegedly that were untrue, and that um, were you know HFT wasn't in their pool or whatever it was. There was all different types of things going on there. Essentially, most people have no idea what's going on in the dark pool. There was a UBS case recently also where they were fined $14 million because in their dark pool they were having uh, misrepresentations as to who was doing what. There's very, very little disclosure when it comes to dark pools. So that's where, I mean, if you want an easy target for regulators to go after, go after the dark pools and say, listen, we need more disclosure on your order types, your participants, how your orders are being filled, where they're being routed, are you paying for flow? You know, this is the stuff that goes on. This is here's a p- perfect example. I'll try. If you're if you're an institutional trader, they have these algorithms on their desk where there's routers supplied by brokers. The router is basically goes through a pinwheel of of different destinations while, before it executes the trade. While it's going through the pinwheel, it may be leaking information to certain dark pools. Who in those dark pools are predators hanging around, just waiting to see who's coming through. As soon as they find out that there's a buyer, what do they do? They cancel the offer and off they go and they take the stock in front of your face. That's not a good thing. But those are all because of monetary incentives designed inside these routers at the brokers. Very easy to clean up. Very easy. Make it a flat fee, get rid of the noise, make or take a model, and so on. But again, the industry has a vested interest in keeping things just the way it is, and they don't want to change it. Well, and uh, why would they? I mean, if you can uh, turn in zero lost trading days and uh, <laughs> just take one to two million dollars a day out of the market, that's, that's uh, yeah, I'd work very hard to preserve that if that was my business. Well, let's just say I think one thing that uh, on the HFC side as well as on the broker side that, that supply these algorithms and the technology, the, the margins are shrinking, and they're shrinking quickly. The profit opportunities aren't there anymore. The equity market has been saturated for a while, so which is why you notice a lot of these HFT firms are starting to go into bonds, starting to go into foreign asset uh, for, uh, currencies, all different types of asset classes that haven't been as exploited, I'll say that. And that's where they're making their money because they basically could strip the equity market there. There's nothing left, and we'll move on. But as their costs rise and their profit margins tend to decrease, some of the smaller players will exit, and we've already seen a couple of them combine and merge because they can't handle it anymore because their technology costs are enormous. To shave a microsecond nowadays costs them a ton of money, right? So not many players can do it. So you, you're starting to see a concentration or a, a, a increase in the larger ones and a drifting off of the smaller ones. I don't know how that's going to play out, but I, I do know their industry is changing. Now, you dedicated uh, Broken Markets, which is a book I recommend to everybody. Uh, you dedicated that to the various participants in Washington, D.C. and Wall Street, uh, without whose actions you never would have become outraged enough to write the book. Uh, do you have another book in you? Uh, <laughs> 
No, I don't think I do. I, I can't. I mean, writing that book was, was, was Sal and I thought it was going to be easy. And we, uh, we're like, okay, let's not do that again. But we, we write a daily <laughs> post. We, 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 every day we write, uh, we'll write a note to our clients, and we usually will post two or three of them to our blog every day. And they're usually thought stimulating, topical areas. Today's post was obviously on yesterday's UK flash uh, crash spoofer. But, you know, we, we try to just keep current, and we look at things differently. You know, we'll, we'll take an approach that the industry normally wouldn't take and ask a question that will probably upset folks in our own industry because we think it's the right thing to do. We think that these questions need to be asked and that the debate needs to be had. And we, we have a decent following, and so it's wonderful that people quote us occasionally and, that they, and it causes some debate, and that's all we're trying to do is, you know, get this thing moving forward. And, gosh, we've been doing it since 2008 talking about this. It's crazy. Seven years we've been talking about market structure, and it's still frustrating as ever. Uh, well, I, I, I share that in, in my own uh, corner of the world that I tend to look at. Uh, the movement is not coming near fast enough for my taste, but uh, that's for me to manage. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for, for spending those eight years and maybe another eight uh, helping us get our markets back and making it all free and fair because that's necessary, essential work. If people want to follow your blog, where do they go? Uh, Themis Trading, T-H-E-M-I-S Trading.com is our website. There's a blog there. I'm also on Twitter, Joe Saluzzi, and then my partner Sal is Themis Sal. We're both on Twitter. We, 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 tweet, we tweet enough. <laughs> we're, we have some fun with it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Joe, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Chris, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it also.